Good to know. <laughs> What's your language? <laughs> no, it's all the language. <laughs> All right, so I think we can get um, started. Before introducing today's speaker, I wanted to welcome you to the third lecture of the annual lecture series organized by the Center for Philosophy of Science online this semester. And uh, before introducing Matt, uh, I wanted to tell you what's happening next week. On Tuesday, Center Fellow Nick Fillon will be giving a talk on the cogency of arguments involving approximations at noon. On, um, on Thursday at 10 a.m., the Cognitive Ontology Seminar is taking place with uh, two speakers from 10 a.m. to 11.30. And on Friday, we have another lunchtime talk given by uh, Center postdoc Mike Schneider on, uh, and the title is Stabs in the Dark Sector, uh, again at noon. If you're interested in any of these talks or events, please go to the center's website, find the calendar, and then you can find links to uh, register for any of these three Zoom events. Uh, today, it's my uh, great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Matt Heber from the University of uh, Utah. Matt is professor at the university that has also been the chair of the Department of Philosophy just to me. That's his last year, so congratulations for leading the department uh, in um, uh, such a good direction. It's been a really, I think we, are, we love the Department of Philosophy at the University of Utah. So, uh, uh, it's been really very successful. Uh, Matt got his PhD a few years ago, 2005, at Davis on the centrality of phylogenetic thinking. Since then, he's become really well known for his work on a range of topics in the philosophy of biology, mostly around phylogeny, but also issues around species and issues around biological individuals. He's published widely on these and related um, topics. Um, and in all the best journals in philosophy of science and philosophy of biology. Um, and he has, I don't know whether it's written yet or even maybe published, he has a paper on phylogenetic inference forthcoming in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which uh, is always an important contribution to a public scholarship. So I'm always keen on this kind of, of, um, of, of, of articles. Um, and today, uh, Matt is going to be talking about, as I've been saying throughout the week, and in fact, maybe for the last two weeks, I, I feel like I was uh, uh, stuttering, the species problem problem and the no solution solution. I think that's a, one of the best titles uh, I've, I've had the pleasure to, uh, to, uh, to repeat over the last few weeks. <laughs> Uh, so uh, before giving Matt the floor or more likely, or more likely the screen, uh, I wanted to remind you about how we're going to proceed for the Q&A. We're using Zoom webinar and not Zoom meeting, which means that most of you at this point are attendees. You can't ask a question directly to Matt. In the Q&A, what you have to do is very simple. Go to the bottom of your screen, click on the Q&A function button, write your name in the text box, and then I'll promote you from attendee to panelist. And you can just ask your question to, uh, to Matt uh, directly, and you can have an exchange with, with Matt. Uh, I'll remind you after Matt's lecture. But now, Matt, the, um, uh, the screen is, is entirely yours. Great. Well, thank you, Edward, and thank you all for inviting me to give a talk. I very much appreciate it. Uh, I wish I could be there in person. Um, I've never visited your center before, and I, I really badly want to. Maybe some other time, maybe next year. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the species problem, one of the well-known and well-tread problems in philosophy of biology, and also in biology. People are streaming in. Uh, some of you may have seen an earlier version of this talk. This is a much more advanced version. I'm really excited to finally be coming to, towards the end of it. Now, despite being a philosopher who works on taxonomy and systematic biology, I've tended to avoid the species problem as a topic because I haven't thought there was a lot of new space to work here. Yet, in recent years, I think there's been some new advances 
that offer room for what I think is a fruitful contribution to this discussion. So I'm gonna start with some bad news. There's not just a species problem, but a species problem problem. But there's good news too. Recognizing this gives us a way out, namely what I call the no solution solution. Furthermore, this shift in perspective reveals a rich research problem, actually several, and that's a great thing for science. So let's unpack these claims in, hope of finding a, in hopes of finding a fruitful way forward. So what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna start with some framing and context that are a little bit separate from the talk, but just set things up a little bit. Then I'll explain what the species problem is and what the species problem problem is and why it's under, best understood as a skeptical problem. I'll then speak about what skeptical problems are a bit generally and what skeptical solutions are. Then I'll explain what my skeptical solution is, which is the no solution solution. Okay, but let's start with just some framing and context here. Since I'm giving a talk at Bit Center for Philosophy of Science, I thought that would be a good place to start. Many of you will recognize this. Uh, this is the founder and first director of the center, as I'm sure you're well aware, um, Adolf Grunbaum. Now, Grunbaum didn't write about species, as far as I know, but bear with me. It's going to circle back around at some point here. His area is more physics and logical empiricism. So a little biographical story here. I got my master's degree at London School of Economics. And like a lot of grad students, I spent a lot of time in the library. And a really cool thing about LSE's library, at least back then, they've moved it. So I don't know if it's still there. Um, Imri Lakatosh, who was also, who was a professor at LSE, his, his book collection is designated in a separate area in LSE's library. And you can go and browse Lakatosh's books. That's really exciting. And while I was doing that, I found this book by Grunbaum, Modern Science and Zeno's Paradoxes. I love Zeno's Paradoxes. It's part of what really drew me into philosophy from my introduction to philosophy class. So it was exciting to find a book like this in Lakatosh's library and to see that someone like Grunbaum also thought that these ancient paradoxes really still resonated. Now the book doesn't claim to be historically a historically accurate telling of Zeno's view, but he instead interprets them through a contemporary logical empiricist lens, which is just what you'd expect a book written by Grunbaum in the 60s to do. Long story short, he suggests we should regard these paradoxes as a sort of commentary on Greek theories of motion and take them as Zeno observing the inadequacies of those for effectively modeling motion. Leibniz and Newton's discovery of calculus and our own contemporary physics should be regarded as competing theories. And all of this gets filtered through the lens of logical empiricism. Okay, two quick points on this. First, when I went back and looked at the book again, years later, um, I'm not entirely confident that I'm giving a faithful exegesis of what Grunbaum's doing. Um, I probably overestimated my confidence in understanding the physics in there, but let's set that aside. The, the main points here are, Grunbaum doesn't wave off these paradoxes as no longer relevant for modern physics. Instead, he thinks that much of the central skeptical problem remains, though contemporary physics is able to sidestep those. And that's part of what this book is about, is how contemporary physics manages around these paradoxes. He also thinks that there was great utility in Zeno's paradoxes favorably citing Bertrand Russell's tribute to how fruitful they've been for modern studies of space, time, and motion. Okay, so we'll come back to that a little bit. I want to give another kind of context, and this is um, the way I think about philosophy of science. So I think about philosophy of science as having lots of different kinds of projects that we can do, and here are four of those. I think these are four important ones. Sometimes we identify the theoretical or methodological or other commitments of scientists. Sometimes we engage in conceptual debates in the sciences. Sometimes, much as a really good film critic can offer critique of film that helps filmmakers make better films, we can do something similar as science critics to help scientists do better science. And of course, we also can draw on the sciences for philosophy. And it's not just philosophers who do this. Uh, at Pittsburgh, you're well aware historians do this as well, uh, and scientists do. 
I think Darwin is for an example of someone who does quite a bit of this. Before I get to the argument, I want to now continue to set a little more context here. So here are two big questions. And these questions should ring somewhat familiar for people trained in both philosophy and biology, though in slightly different ways. So let me explain what I mean. On the one hand, when I have my philosophy hat on, these look like really classic metaphysical questions. I think they're really Aristotelian in a lot of ways. Um, it's because I like Aristotle probably. But these are the kind of questions Aristotle and lots of metaphysicians and philosophers have wrestled with. At the same time, we can also consider how our scientific theories or investigations inform how we answer these questions about particular objects of study. So Darwin, again, provided a really wonderful context with the origin of species, which changed how biologists answer these questions and how they might serve as launching points for research projects. And of course, species and taxa are an obvious example of this. How do we know when something becomes a new species? But it, there's other context too. So for example, how do you distinguish reproduction from growth? That's not always obvious. And that's been a topic that philosophers and biologists have both dug into. And it's a nice intersection of the fields. But even setting aside that intersection, contemporary biologists still do work on these two questions. So this is a really nice paper by Kevin Padian and Jack Horner, the paleontologists, where they argue that birds are dinosaurs. Padian especially is really philosophically astute and sophisticated. They fully understand that the claim birds are dinosaurs is an identity claim, and they offer arguments to that effect. To be fair, they don't say it that way. They're using a different set of terminology. It's a different field, but that's what they're doing. Now, we can leave aside whether I think they're right or not, although I, I do think they're right. And gratuitous aside, here's a dinosaur that was recently discovered in Utah by colleagues of mine at the Natural History Museum, which I can see right over there. Uh, and this dinosaur, due to its position in the evolutionary tree, is hypothesized to be one of the first animals in the dinosaur clade or the dinosaur, of the dinosaurs to have feathers. Pretty exciting. But setting aside whether I agree with their argument or not, I think it's a great example of the sort of problems biologists and philosophers of biology engage with. Moreover, these are metaphysical questions. They're questions about what sorts of things there are in the world, under what sorts of conditions those things can persist over time, and what makes two things the same or different. And I think when you're coming from philosophy, metaphysics can often feel really abstract and big. But I think there's a lot, I think there's a lot more of it being done than we sometimes see. Payton and Horner's paper. And I think that we should see and recognize that as metaphysics as well. So although this is kind of an aside and it's a little bit of a soapbox view, I really want you to think about today's talk as a metaphysics talk and about how resolving a metaphysics problem in biology helps shift focus to more fruitful and exciting research problems. Okay. So let's move on. I'm gonna start by describing the species problem problem. Or another way to think of it is, the species problem is even worse than you think. And I'll tell you what the species problem is if you don't know. But the punchline here is gonna be that there's unlikely to be a single solution to this problem. That there's unlikely to be a single fact of the matter which resolves the species, pro species problem. And then we should, rec and we should recognize that as a genuinely skeptical problem. So I'm gonna look at what's gonna be a pretty relatively simple but real example. And then I'll start complicating things a little bit. I don't wanna to spend too much time motivating the species problem problem, but this should get things going well enough, hopefully without getting too bogged down. All right, this is an example of a polar bear crossing. And I bet you're all laughing really hard at my dad joke there. I can't help it, I really like it. But I wanna highlight a couple of ways that this example, I'll explain what I mean in a minute here, how this generates disputes over how to, mark, how to mark groups as distinct species. And although the empirical data is important, it's really the conceptual disagreement over what species are 
that is a species problem that's really at stake. So if you get lost in the details, don't worry too much, try and keep track of that uh, conceptual disagreement and, uh, and that's at stake here. Okay, so what's going on in this example? Well, we've got on the right-hand side, we have a mitochondrial tree and a nuclear tree. And over here, we have a phylogenetic tree. These are trees that display the evolutionary histories of brown bears, polar bears, and black bears. Historically, mitochondrial DNA was used to try to reconstruct the evolutionary history of this polar bear complex. And as you can see, this little blue box here, that's the polar bears. That's a little group. It's a distinct group inside of this larger brown box and includes brown bears. And over here, these little lines represent genealogical histories and relatedness. So over here, we have some brown bears that are more closely related to these polar bears than they are to these brown bears over here. In 2012, um, a group of biologists reconstructed the evolutionary history using nuclear DNA instead of mitochondrial DNA, and they found a different pattern and a different history. Where over here, this polar bear group looks like it emerged about 100,000 years ago. On the nuclear DNA, it looks like the polar bears started becoming a distinct lineage about 600 to a million years ago, and that they were fully um, distinct from the brown bears. That is, they weren't inside of this brown bear group. Biologists call this clade a clade. Okay, so what happened here? Well, what they think happened is mitochondrial DNA, one fact about that is that in mammals, it's passed from generation to generation through the mother. It's a matrilineal uh, genomic uh, or, or a matrilineal organelle where nuclear DNA comes from both the mother and the father. What scientists think happened is around 600 to a million years ago, 600,000 million years ago, polar bear and brown bear lineages started to split, started to come apart. And then around 100,000 years ago, female brown bears mated with male polar bears in a crossover event and in hybridization and regression. And that those female brown bears brought their mitochondria with them. And those mitochondria are now found in polar bears. So we have a split where it starts around 600,000 a million years ago. You get pretty good separation. And then 100,000 years ago, you get this hybridization. Okay. So there's a lot of competing theoretical concepts to draw on here, a lot of which give a lot of different answers. And if any of you have seen me give a talk in probably the last six or seven years, you've probably seen this example because I really like it. It's a clean example that shows all kinds of cool things going on in phylogenetics and taxonomy and systematics. But let's focus on a couple of things here. If I was to ask you what, what, whether or not polar bears and brown bears are different species, there's a lot of ways you could answer that question from this example. So one would be to note that polar bears and brown bears are still able to interbreed. So then they must be in the same species. Now, it might be that the polar bear lineage was and still is, maybe, an incipient species, but hasn't gotten there yet. So it started to become a distinct species, but then these hybridization events pulled it back in. Okay. On the other hand, on at least a few accounts, the polar bear lineage in either of these might count as an evolutionarily distinctive lineage, despite the mitochondrial crossover. And on those accounts, we call them distinct species. So roughly those two approaches correspond to an interbreeding species concept and to a phylogenetic species concept. There are so many more concepts that we could go into though. Uh, those are kind of two big categories of them. Um, but the take home is whether we're going to count these as different species or not, um, is going to depend a bit on which species concept we think is the right one to use here or which one we think is the right one to always use. So for example, even though the interbreeding concept where because they can breed with each other, mate with each other successfully, uh, treats them as the same species, there's other versions of the interbreeding concept which might not treat them that way. It kind of depends on where we put some of these barriers or how we consider um, successful mating. On the other hand, there's different phylogenetic species concepts, which would treat them as distinct species or one in the same species. So I'm not gonna spend a lot more time laying out a whole bunch of different species concepts, 
just want to give you an example of one way that the data that we look at isn't always going to be the arbiter of which, whether these things are species or not. Um, by rough estimates, there's about 20 to 30 different working species concepts that biologists use. And it, it, these aren't just here and there, uh, they're genuinely useful concepts that biologists employ. And most of these disagreements are conceptual ones. They're, what, they're disagreements over what sorts of groups are the groups we should call species. The data alone typically aren't going to resolve that debate. So one way we can sum up this problem, I can, I can pull from Richard Richards, his book, The Species Problems. One standard way to state it that he uses is that when biologists employ multiple species concepts that group and divide organisms in conflicting ways, this challenges the view that species are real and that there's a single unified species concept. Now you might have a different way of thinking about what the species problem is. This is from Rich Richards. That's fine. It's gonna, it won't matter too much which of these you think is the right way of, of, of presenting this. Okay. Now, I just wanna take a moment to notice something here. It's not just a single thing that's generating the species problem, even in a simple case like this. Worse, we can't even agree on what it is that's generating the species problem to begin with. That's the species problem problem. So let me, let me explain that a little more. So we've got our species problem or a species problem. It is, there's lots of ways, uh, there's, sorry, there'll be lots of ways to, 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 to generate this. And these species problems are disputes over what sorts of groupings we ought to count as species. Okay. And not only do we not agree on what a species is, we're unlikely to agree on what it is that's generating this problem in the first place. So here are just a few ways you can generate a species problem. Now I'm, I'm far from the first to notice this, but it's really easy for that to get pushed into the background and not really appreciate how much this amplifies the species problem. So for example, um, the species problem can be driven by disputes about theories. So you might, uh, for, so for example, um, whether species should be prospective or retrospective is one way to generate a species problem. That is, should we identify groups of species that have held together in the, in the past? So there's some history that we're, we're capturing when we mark that group as a species, or should we adopt a prospective view of what species are? That is try to identify those groups that are, we think are likely to hold together moving forward. Those are gonna gener generate different concepts of what a species is. There's other theory problems too. So we might disagree over whether the groups we mark as species should represent processes that we think are important for speciation or whether they should represent genealogical patterns that we discover as we go through the history of, of, of evolution. Um, a couple more examples. Are we identifying taxonomic units or are we looking at particular sorts of evolved groups of entities? Right? So this is a ranking versus grouping kind of problem. Now, in many cases, the species concepts generated by all of these different debates are going to end up generating species concepts that cross cut each other. So it's not like we get a one to one mapping from some problem to the kind of concepts that are being generated from them. I'm going to skip my levels of lineage problem. This is mine. I like this one a lot. But so when I say that there isn't just a species problem, but a species problem problem, what I mean is that we can't even settle on what's, what the problem is to begin with. So within any species problem, we're unlikely to come to a resolution. There's simply unlikely to be any fact of the matter that resolves that species, that resolves the species problem. There's a lot of reasons for that. I'm, I'm not actually getting into that many, but um, Biologists have lots of different research interests and are studying different kinds of things and different species concepts are gonna work better or worse for that. But if we can't even agree on what the problem is to begin with, we won't even be able to get to that point where we can, where we're gonna be able to start having that discussion. 
So the biologists aren't even agreeing on what the question is. The upshot is that agreement on empirical data isn't going to produce a single correct answer to the species problem. It's too tied up in other conceptual debates. There's unlikely to be a single fact of the matter solution to the species problem. Now for philosophers, this should start ringing a bell. So cases where we think there are structural blocks to there being an answer or solution are good cases for skepticism. And I think that's right. I think we should be skeptical with regard to the species problem. Now I used to resist saying I was a skeptic about species. When I would give talks, people would accuse me of it and I would defend it and say, no, I'm not a skeptic. But I, I think that I come around. So I was more inclined to a pretty complex view that at first glance looks like pluralism, but I thought was really a complex multidimensional view. And it was really confusing and it, I still like it, but it's too confusing. But I'm also now a skeptic. And I think this works better. Okay, before I move on, I wanna to return to this example so I can offer two more quick thoughts that I want you to kind of hold, hold on to as we get through, as we move through this talk. First, I think it's really easy to confuse skepticism for cynicism. And it's kind of odd, but for a debate that's so well covered by philosophers and scientists, both of whom are supposed to know this, I think cynicism and, and skepticism get conflated a lot. And so people throw their hands up and get frustrated with the species problem and the species debate and just wanna give up on it and get rid of species. But I think that's the wrong move. I think that's a cynical move. And I think a skeptical one is better. And you'll see why in a little bit. Second, and this one's really important. So I'm just going to pause for a second. Okay, get off the email, get off the, the, the browsing the web. Here, here's something to hang on to and pay attention to for a minute here. Okay, so this is really important. I want to pay attention to what the biologists are doing here. I know we, it, it seems like every generation of philosophers of science talks about the turn towards practice. Um, but this has been going on for a while, but it's still really important. Right? Like Rubenbaum, he was paying attention to physicists, but it's really important. And in this case, here's what's happening. There's two different sorts of markers being used by the biologists here, nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA. And they're being used to study the evolutionary history of these lineages. They provide ways of measuring different processes and they indicate different degrees of divergence of those processes or patterns of divergence. Each on their own, right? The nuclear and mitochondrial DNA, each on their own is really useful and interesting, but together they tell an even more complete story. And that's really useful. And that's why this paper got published in science because it's a really important discovery. And so looking at these different histories and understanding how they come together turns out to be a really important and useful thing in biology and a really impactful thing that we learned from this study. So hang on to that because we're going to come back to that later. First, I want to talk a little bit more about skeptical problems and how to respond to them. Okay, so the species problem, I think it's a genuinely skeptical problem. We're unlikely to come to any a resolution about it, there's unlikely to be a fact of the matter that resolves the species problem. But skeptical problems aren't necessarily bad. They just call for a particular sort of strategy. Often they can be really insightful, especially when we think of them as heuristics. Now, not in every case, but in this one, I think, and I think a few other important ones. So let me explain what I mean. Here's two examples of philosophers that defend this account of skeptical problems as useful heuristics, among other things. And I really like this quote from John Greco. What he's doing is he's, he's observing that skeptical arguments have a real utility to them in the way that they help push progress and drive progress. And they help us understand what knowledge we do have. Now he's mostly concerned with Hume and Descartes and in how taking their skeptical argument seriously supports a reliableist view of epistemology. I'm not gonna have anything else to say about reliableism and epistemology. That's not really my interest here. Um, but what I think he's right about is that there's a lot of utility to be found when we discover a genuinely skeptical argument. Kripke, similarly, argues that this is true 
of an argument about reference from Wittgenstein, or at least Kripke's Wittgenstein. More to the point, Kripke argues that there are two sorts of responses to a skeptical argument. First, you could offer a, a straight answer, which tries to directly answer the skeptic. I'll explain what that is in, a little, in just a minute. But there's also skeptical responses or skeptical answers to a, to a skeptical argument. A skeptical response leaves the central skeptical problem intact and seeks other avenues for moving forward. These typically involve trading off one set of problems for another. And hopefully those other problems are more tract tractable um, and, and do some of the work we want them, we wanted to do with the first set. Now he defends the, the latter in this book, uh, Skeptical Solution. Skeptical solutions are harder to, to present and harder to articulate. They're, they're a lot more subtle and nuanced, but they're really interesting. So I wanna take a look at each sort of response just to get some footing here. First though, a caveat. I think there's probably lots of kinds of skeptical problems. I don't think there's a single kind of skeptical problem. And these might be useful or insightful or not in different ways. That's not really my project here, but it's worth mentioning because the example I'm gonna offer at least here, it's not the same sort of skeptical problem as the one we see in the species problem. So I have a little cartoon about Zeno's paradox. Zeno's paradox is a paradox. That's what's generating the skepticism. Uh, in this case of species, and it turns out in Kripke's discussion of Wittgenstein, um, the skepticism arises from, the from, from there not being a single fact of the matter that we might expect could settle the problem, or perhaps even the impossibility of that happening. But Zeno's paradox is familiar, it's easy to present, uh, and I'm not, I don't want to go into Kripke's plus versus quest example here. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it, it's a great, it's a really good book and it's interesting, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, I, then I'd have to spend the whole time explaining what quest is. So let's look at Zeno's paradox. It's great. It's one of my favorites and it's a good example of how skeptical problems can get generated. So a standard view, I alluded to it earlier, is that Leibniz and Newton's um, discovery of calculus effectively answered Zeno's paradox. This can be viewed as a straight solution, although it took a long time to get there, but it's a straight solution because it directly answers the skeptical challenge of the paradox. All right, so at least on one standard view, Leibniz and Newton, uh, their, the invention of calculus resolves the central skeptical problem of Zeno's paradoxes of motion. So it's a straight answer, it directly responds to the skeptic's concern. Now that's not an entirely uncontroversial claim. And earlier I talked about Grunbaum's book in Modern Science and Zeno's Paradoxes. And there, I think um, it's not as obvious on Grunbaum's account that he treats calculus um, or modern physics as a straight response. Instead, he thinks these paradoxes still resonate and still need to be taken seriously by modern physics, but that there are competing theories and competing models that allow better um, responses to the empirical challenges that we're facing. Now, I, th I think that's a close to a skeptical solution. I'm not convinced it's full on skeptical solution. Um, but one thing that is clear is that Grunbaum views Zeno as identifying a serious deficiency with ancient Greek models of motion and that he thinks that this has been a generative and fruitful endeavor. All right, I wanna take another, look at another example that have some well-known skeptical solutions. Maybe, we'll see. So Hume and Descartes on Greco's account offer two prominent and important skeptical arguments. And Hume's problem of induction, especially, has resonated with philosophers of science. A lot of us have thought about it, written about it. We care about the problem of induction. Karl Popper famously thought he solved the problem of induction with a straight solution, namely falsifiability. Now, I'm not sure how many other people think that he, that he solved the problem of induction with this, but it was an attempt at a straight solution nonetheless. He thought falsifiability 
solve the problem of induction in the context of science. That it was no longer something we had to be concerned about. It was a direct response to the central skeptical problem. When we think about probabilistic reasoning, on the other hand, it's a lot less clear. I think there's an ongoing dispute over whether probabilistic reasoning should be understood as a straight solution to human problem of induction or something else, something like a skeptical solution. Now, I'm not sure that philosophers of science that we've used this language per se, but the key point here is that whether a solution leaves a central, central skeptical problem intact or not is what determines whether it's a skeptical solution. So if you think that probabilistic reasoning constitutes a straight solution to Hume's problem of induction, then you think it's no longer really a problem. It's been resolved. In much the same way calculus resolves Zeno's paradox as emotion by re replacing discrete with continuous mathematics. And that's certainly a prominent view. On the other hand, if you think probabilistic reasoning is a skeptical solution, then you think that Hume's problem of induction remains intact but that we've changed the conversation with probabilistic reasoning. We've traded off Hume's problem of induction for other challenges raised by probabilistic reasoning. That is, we've traded off Hume's problem of induction for a problem of induction, inductive reasoning or probabilistic reasoning. And the bet is that probabilistic reasoning will be more tractable than Hume's problem of induction, leading to fruitful and productive lines of inquiry. So Hume's problem of induction on the skeptical solution, the central skeptical challenge remains intact, but we've traded it off for a different problem or a different challenge, namely probabilistic reasoning. Another related way we could think about responses to skepticism come from the pragmatist. So Peirce and William James, um, they have other sorts of responses to um, skeptical problems, James especially. Now, I'm, I'm not an expert on pragmatism, so this is kind of an area that I want to start exploring quite a bit more. And I want to see if these family of responses from the pragmatists might count as skeptical responses or skeptical solutions. One thing I think speaks to that favor is the way that trade-offs and strategies play a, a, a front and center role in these accounts. So James, for example, I, 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 this is one of my favorite things from James, I, I love it. He says um, that, there's a, that there's a sense of uh, personal risk and values in our, in our epistemological stance. So if you want to avoid believing falsehoods, then you should not believe anything. On the other hand, if you want to avoid failing to believe a truth, then you should just believe everything. And where you lay in that spectrum, he doesn't think there's a right answer to it. He thinks it's a matter of what you think the right risk is there. What kind of trade-offs are you willing to make? Um, and where do your values lie in terms of avoiding falsehoods or failing to believe truths? And I think that trade-off and strategy resonates a bit in the way we should think about what skeptical solutions look like. So I'd like to explore that a little bit more and how it relates to a focus on scientific practice, especially. But for now, let's move on. Okay. So species problem problem is a skeptical problem. Skeptical problems aren't necessarily bad. They can be really insightful and process to explore problems in new and productive ways. And we can try to respond with straight solutions, which dissolve the skeptical problem, or skeptical ones, which typically involve trade-offs and leave the skeptical problem intact. In the case of the species problem problem, I'm going to call the skeptical solution the no solution solution. So let's return to this example. You might be getting sick of it by now, but here's a proposal. I could ask you where you think the species are on this, on this tree or in this area. But rather than focusing on identifying the precise point at which one of these lineages satisfies some criteria for being a species or not, I'm gonna propose that the focus should instead be in understanding the various processes by which these individual lineages gradually become distinct. 
This amounts to shifting our focus, namely trading off from a question about species to a question about lineages. Namely, rather than ask what is a species in a case like this, and it turns out all cases are gonna be cases like this, we should instead ask questions like, what lineages should we be tracking? Okay, great, right? So we're trading off a species problem for a lineage problem. Okay, well, what's that mean? Well, before we had the problem of deciding on which species concept should be applied. Now we have the problem of which lineage we ought to track. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, you've done it, you've solved it, great. Hold on, not quite there yet. Here's why this might worry you. There's a lot of lineages we could track. So in this example, we could track nuclear DNA or mitochondrial DNA. But notice we get different histories in those cases. That turns out to be the case pretty commonly. So it's hard to see what this image is, but what's going on here is um, biologists are looking at the way gene trees don't always line up with each other. So if you have a population or a species um, uh, phylogeny, so you're looking at the history of groups of species or populations, you can look at individual gene trees also, individual histories of genes. And sometimes those line up with the larger groups that they're a part of, sometimes they don't. And this discordance is something we really need to be aware of if we're gonna be trading off a species problem for lineage problem. As many of you know, it gets even worse when you start looking at microbes. So for animals like us, when we transmit our DNA, it's through what's called vertical transmission. It's through processes of reproduction. Microbes are a lot different. When microbes bump into each other, instead of shaking hands, they basically exchange DNA. And what that ends up doing is creating these reticulate networks of histories of individual gene trees. And they cross cut each other in all kinds of ways. And it gets really messy really fast. But let's get back to this. This is an easier example, but this is why I said that all cases are gonna be like this. This is about as clean and simple a case as you're gonna find. So trading off a species problem for lineage problem isn't without complication. But here's the good news. The lineage problem is highly tractable. It's largely an empirical and methodological problem. More than that, when the patterns or groups we are tracking with different lineages are in conflict, like the mitochondrial and DNA trees here, even if you didn't understand the last two slides, hopefully you can see that the, nu that the nuclear mitochondrial evolutionary histories are different here, right? So when we see different lineages in conflict, one way to understand that is it reveals internal structure and complexity of the processes of divergence and diversification. That's precisely what it is we're trying to do when we set out to study speciation. When lineages are displaying discordance, it's a reflection of empirical facts of how nested, hierarchically structured lineages diverge. Okay, that's just a fancy way of saying, remember what I told you earlier to remember? that looking at the mitochondrial DNA and looking at nuclear DNA on their own, each give you interesting histories, but taken together give you a richer history. So the lineage problem is more of a methodological tool than a conceptual problem and an opportunity, not a conceptual conflict. Once we start seeing this as data, not noise, it becomes a really rich area for biologists to dig into. Let me give you an example, and an example that shows that different markers are gonna reveal different kinds of information. So there's all kinds of reasons biologists might wanna resolve divergence at different degrees of resolution, scale, and time, and they need to find the right markers to do that. So this is, an, this is a study done by a colleague of mine here at the University of Utah, Mike Shapiro. If, anyone's ever, if any of you have read The Origin of Species, you know that chapter one is all about pigeons. It's just like listing pigeon after pigeon after pigeon. Darwin and his buddies were big pigeon breeders. We get it, right? And he kind of thinks through this and he 
and Darwin hypothesizes what the genealogy of pigeon breeds are. Now, all these pigeon breeds, they're the same species. It's a breed, like a breed of dog. What Mike did um, is there's still pigeon breeders today, and they have these big conventions. And Mike decided, he's an evolutionary developmental biologist, he wanted to figure out whether Darwin was right. So he set out to test Darwin's hypothesis of pigeon breed genealogy from chapter one of the origin. But to do that, he had to find the right marker. So what you're seeing here, these, these look like phylogenetic trees, and they are, but they're not a species. They're of breeds within the pigeon species or within the pigeon group. Let's say that for right now. It turns out Darwin did pretty well, actually. He, uh, a lot of what he thought uh, the relationships were, were, were pretty spot on. But the point is that if we took a really categorical view about species, these kinds of studies might not be as obvious to see. And rather than asking whether lineages have crossed some threshold of being species or not, and then declaring our work done, instead, the lineage problem reinforces the idea that the degree of divergence can be measured in really precise and novel ways, and that divergence does not end. It doesn't stop. Once two things become species, they, they don't stop diverging from each other. And looking at those different levels of resolution of divergence require different markers and then different scales, but it produces far more insight about the diversification of lineages and taxa than the relatively static, categorical, and all too often misleading designation of achieving the rank of species might do. I just threw this reference up here, how to fail at species delimitation. There's a group of biologists making a very similar point, that if we just take the idea that once you hit species, you're done diverging, you're missing a lot of important action going on in evolution. So these are distinct species, turns out to be an imprecise and ambiguous statement. Providing an account of divergence in terms of lineages produces a far more sophisticated and precise account that we can use to study, the, study evolution in a lot of biology. Okay, so I've advocated we ought to trade off the species problem for lineage problem. This amounts to a skeptical solution to the species problem because the species problem remains intact, but we now have traded it off for a more effective and, and insightful question and approach. But here's a challenge to my view. Some of you may have already thought of this. What should we name as species on the no solution solution, right? I mean, that was one of the issues of the species problem. Which groups are we going to call species? Which groups of organisms? We still want to do that, right? Species are still things, or at least units that biologists value and use. And so pretending like there's no species seems like we're burying our head in the sand. Or maybe we can. Can we just get rid of species? That's what Brent Mishler and others have said. That's what I call the cynical view. Am I just sneaking a cynical view in under the cover of a skeptical one? I don't think I am. So let me give you a few responses to that. First, the no solution solution, it doesn't preclude debates over what might be named or otherwise identified as a species taxon. Far from it, though those debates ought to be couched in terms of lineage divergence and maintenance, at least on the lineage view. Many of those debates will reflect some of the very same interests that mark ongoing disputes over species concepts, but they're grounded in a more tra tractable way. That's gonna be fruitful and healthy, and it reflects both genuine theoretical and empirical disputes while respecting the principle of taxonomic freedom. Also, and this is really important, I've been pushing this lineage view, right? I've been pushing the view, well, trade off the species problem for a lineage problem. That's only part of this no solution solution. You could trade off the species problem for lots of other problems or perspectives. So for example, you could trade off the species problem for a conservation problem, where the challenge is identifying the units of conservation. That may be more than just an empirical problem, right? It almost certainly includes political and cultural considerations as well. Yet in many cases, it's gonna be more practical and useful for designating or marking groups of organisms as species or subspecies or population segments. Right? So one response I would sometimes get to this talk when I've given it earlier versions was, well, 
Are we going to, how do you designate something as an endangered species? Well, in that case, you're really trading off the species problem, which isn't set to do that work for a conservation problem. Second, I'll suggest a pragmatic approach here. And that's not an entirely unfamiliar response to skeptical problems, as I described earlier. Ultimately, biologists will, will use those names and taxonomies that are a useful, and biologists will use those names and taxonomies that are useful in advanced research efforts effectively. If you've been reading any of Ken Waters' stuff in the last few, few years, uh, you're going to hear his view resonating in that claim. Names and monographs that lack utility or good justification will fail to get used. We see this all the time in systematics and taxonomies. Lousy, lousy taxonomies just fall off the map. Now, this isn't without complication. As biologists use taxonomies for different research interests, there may well be conflicts in those taxonomies. How much, if at all, should, we, should this concern us? I think that rather than seeking to find the single correct solution in cases like this, that is to presume a solution to the species problem, we should instead embrace the complexity of the underlying biology that these conflicts reflect. That is, embrace the species problem problem and the no solution solution. What's, the, what's generating that conflict? Finally, one thing I like about this, this view is that the no solution solution reflects practice and training in evolutionary biology, at least as I experienced it. Practically speaking, the species problem problem is just a description of the state of evolving complex systems that requires a sophisticated approach to navigate. It's precisely that sophistication that we expect when we train graduate students in biology. So for example, a common question a biologist might hear at their dissertation defense is, what do you think a species is? And that gets asked not so much because we expect them to be able to adequately defend some specific species concept that they might be advocating, but we want them to demonstrate to us a careful understanding of why there's a debate over this in the first place and how they navigate it. And that's precisely what the no solution solution approach captures. Okay, that's my argument. But before I get to my, my conclusion, I, I have to explain this slide. So I always like to let my 13 year old pick an image when I'm giving a talk. I give him, tell him, pick a slide, pick an image. Um, he really liked this image a lot and he thought it would be a good one to finish on. Thought you'd all be happy I was done with my talk. So there you go. I'm happy. But let's conclude. And I wanna conclude under this really nice quotation from Robert O'Hara who I think holds a very similar view to what I'm advocating here. There's not just a species problem, but a species problem problem. This is a genuinely skeptical problem because, because there's unlikely to be a single fact of the matter that will resolve this problem. But skeptical problems aren't necessarily bad problems. They may just require a skeptical solution. That's precisely what I advocate here, namely the no solution solution. Thank you all very much. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, one of the downsides of Zoom webinar that we cannot really clap, uh, but <laughs> I'm sure all the attendees are clapping in front of their, their, their screen. So let me, let me remind you uh, uh, how we're going to be proceeding. If you uh, have um, a question, please write your name in the Q&A uh, uh, box by clicking on the Q&A button. And I will promote you right now to uh, the status of panelists and you can ask your question directly. All right. It takes one or two seconds to, to transition from one step to the other. Yep. So, Sidas, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thanks. Yeah, so my question is about the use of the phrase skepticism. And usually in philosophy, when we say skepticism, we say, uh, we use it in an epistemological sense, right? Like there are things that we question whether we know or not, whether our ordinary modes of knowing are reliable or not, or justifiable or not. But here you seem to be saying something that's perhaps ontological, perhaps more having to do with what kinds of 
categories are appropriate if you want to phrase it in a pragmatic way. So there, you know, you it seems to me the phrase that's more appropriate would be something like anti-realism or perhaps nominalism. Um, so I'm just curious as to why you insist on the word skepticism. And in particular, for example, you drew the analogy with Zeno's paradox. I don't, I never thought of Zeno's paradoxes as a kind of skeptical challenge. It's just a paradox about how motion is possible, right? That's, it's a question about ontology. Motion is clearly possible. Here's an argument that, so, that says it's not possible. Tell me where I went wrong in that argument, right? So I'm just curious about this use of the word skepticism and do you really mean it in the epistemological sense? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll tell you what happened was I, I ended up just embracing the term. So before I adopted this view, I was often accused of being a skeptic about species. And I think I held a view similar to what you're saying. I just didn't think it was properly thought of as skeptical. Um, but I, when I started looking into literature on skepticism, there's so many ways of thinking about what skeptical arguments are. And what I ended up doing, the reason that I decided this is a skeptical problem, it's a very particular sort, I'm really drawing on, on Kripke here and his Wittgenstein on rules and private language account of what skepticism is. So he's looking at a complicated example from that. Well, it's simple in some ways, but an example from mathematics where he argues that there's, there's not gonna be a, a single fact of the matter that resolves the question being posed to him. And the response is to develop this skeptical response as he calls it, a skeptical solution. And so I'm adopting that language there. No, maybe it's, I mean, is it going to be, is it going to count as a skeptical view on every single account? No, and, and in some ways it's actually even a, a really soft skepticism because maybe it's actually more like Zeno's paradox where what, Z, what, what happened was eventually we figured out a way to solve that problem and be able to more effectively model motion. Maybe that's what will happen with his species problem. Maybe a view will come up that we go, oh, hey, we got it. We don't have to be skeptics about species anymore. So that, that's the notion of skepticism that I'm embracing, but it's, it's really pulling from that uh, with the Kripkenstein as, as sometimes that book is referred to. If I, if I may just quickly follow up on that, Edward, is that okay? Okay, thanks. Uh, so yeah, so I haven't actually read that book, but from what I've read of secondhand accounts of it, there, uh, right, you're talking about whether someone is actually using the plus function or someone is using this Q's function, right? Which sort of cuts off after some sufficiently large number and changes something else. Um, so there I, I can see um, why it's a kind of epistemological skepticism because someone is following a rule yeah. and I think I know what rule they're following. Turns out I don't have very good grounds to believe that I know that yeah. they're following that particular rule. But here, it's not as if, so is, are you saying that there are, people think there are species, but we don't have good grounds to believe there are species and you're just agnostic on whether there are species as such, because in the case of the rule following paradox, there's no doubt that plus is a function that is well-defined, right? That plus yep. exists. The question is whether we know that, whether someone is using that function, but here, there's a question of whether spe species actually exist or not, right? So that's a, that's a sort of prior question of whether species exists even before we get to whether we know whether there are species or not. I think here it's not rules that are, that are generating this, but it's in some ways it's practice. It's that we know biologists have all different kinds of research interests and activities they're engaged in. And this is part of what's generating that species problem. So I never said, I don't think like, I never said I don't think there's groups that are good groups that we can that we can measure uh, using phylogenetic or interbreeding techniques, right? Those are real groups there. And I think those are good groups in the same way that plus and quests both function well as mathematical rules. But here what's not gonna be resolved is whether there's gonna be a single interest in biology that's gonna be the prior, that, that's gonna claim priority and win the day in the species concept debate. And in fact, I think there's good reason to think that none of those views should have priority, right? There's no one that's the anchor that's the view. And there's no fact of the matter that's going to settle. Okay, we're all agreed now, this is the right species concept. 
all of those are generating really interesting ways of grouping taxa and they're serving a, a useful function. That's why I said when there's you know 20 to 30 different species concepts, they're actually used by biologists, right? I, I'm not counting any that don't get used. If they're dead concepts, they're not useful. They're, no, they're, they're of no use to anyone. But there's so many species concepts that do get used. But what's driving those are practice and research interests. And biology is so complex. It's got so many different ways of diving in there that no one is going to gain priority. So that's where there's no, that's what's driving no single fact of the matter about what's, what the right notion of species is going to be. Okay, thank you. I, I can say more. I guess to me, that sounds like a kind of idealism, but perhaps that's, I, I should stop there. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Idas. Uh, Mike, go for it. Hey, Matt, how are you doing? Great. Great talk. Um, as you might expect, uh, I'm not going to ask a, a philosophical question about skepticism. I want to talk about lineage problems. Great. So, why do you think that lineage actually helps you in any sense in this <laughs> uh, pinpointing lineage diversity or divergence or even what a lineage is? And I, I think you've actually undercut that in your own talk, right? Because in the bear example, 45 individuals, 14 nuclear DNAs, six overlapping haplotypes, and therefore they say there's introgression, right? Same kind of clustering example in the pigeons with a bunch of different genes. And you said, whatever gene we pick, we're going to get a different answer. Yeah. So aren't lineages just these completely subjective things that we can make, say, whatever we want? So my favorite systematics paper is the one that says systematics is just like reading the entrails of chickens. <laughs> Why don't we have this entrail reading problem once we resort to the lineage solution? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so I, I see Salsa on here too. He's going he's gonna to push me in a similar way, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, so I, I think it's a lot more tractable than you're giving it credit for. So it's not, I mean, my view on lineages is that what we should be doing is looking at how often lineages are clustering with one another. How often are they recurring over generational time? And if we had cases where it was completely random, there'd be no signal there. But the reason I think it's more tractable and a better problem to trade off for is that that's not what we find. We do find these clusters of lineages that track each other in different ways. And when they don't track each other, we can see patterns emerging that tell us uh, or give us clues about which process led to that failure to track, that to that discordance. So I think you're right if, if, if the lineages were just kind of randomly being, uh, if they're randomly distributed and there were no patterns there that we could pull from, absolutely right. But that's what, this is part of what prompted this paper is watching biologists start to appreciate over the last 10 years what that internal structure of lineages is, is doing and the different patterns they can pull from those. I, I think it's really exciting. I think it's one of the most exciting parts in systematics right now. I agree with you. Let me just pose you a little empirical problem. Yeah. How about all the papers that get published show that nice pattern? And the ones that don't get published don't show that pattern. And so what you're yeah. actually not, what you're seeing here is an artifact of what it takes to get a lineage published, not in fact, what's empirically discovered. Yeah, that could be true. Um, but I think, I mean, what I, what, what gives me, what, what leads me to think that's probably not the case. Well, that probably is the case that people aren't getting published if they don't find interesting patterns. Uh, and there is that worry that we're only getting one side of that, of that, uh, research program publish. But what I think is really, what, what, what makes me think that even in that case, there's still something there is um, 10 years ago when I would talk to biologists about these sorts of things, a lot of times they would see that discordance as noise that they would just ignore. And as they started to figure out, wait a minute, there's actually patterns there as we've developed more sophisticated techniques and more powerful computing power to pull those apart when they go back and look at those systems, they keep finding those patterns over and over and over again. So it seems like those patterns and, and that there's something about tracking lineages and the way lineages track together or don't track together that are turn out to be really interesting. So I think there's already been a shift by recognizing, wait a minute, when lineages don't track, that's not noise that we throw out or don't publish. It turns out that could be something we do publish. So I think you're right, it could keep going. And I saw I saw a really nice comment from uh, John Wilkins in, in the comments about the species problem, problem, problem. Some, right, I mean, the same, it's in the same vein here that it could be that there's 
still stuff they're not the biologists aren't recognizing as interesting that might be interesting or might cut a, a, against this recent trend and, and that certainly could happen but but I, I think that there's so much so much happening around this and it's so exciting that I I'm, I'm willing to bet on the lineage view for for now anyway but if it doesn't then, then we trade it off for another problem that's a better problem cool uh Sandy Hi, Matt. It's good to see you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I guess I'm going to go back kind of to a little bit of what Siddharth was after, maybe. And, and that's the question is that you, you wanted us to embrace the view that this was a metaphysical problem. Yeah. Um, but it seems to me, and your solution, which is one that I, I find um, attractive because I am a pluralist of of not of the water stripe, but of different stripe mm -hmm. that suggests that um, this is a representational problem and not a what there is in the world problem, but how do we want to classify? You never mentioned the word classification. Okay, how do we wanna, how do we want our theories, concepts, language to um, represent what there is in the world? Even we can, I can agree if I'm doing a mitochondrial, the mitochondrial lineage, that there is a lineage in, in the in the nuclear too. I think they're both there, right? Yep. Okay, they're both in the world. But the question is, what is the 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 problem of of, of describing uh, the the um, distinctness, the two problems? You know, when is it one thing? When is it uh, two one type of thing? These are classification and representational questions. We can agree about the metaphysics, so I and get different answers to the representational questions. So, in what sense do you mean it's metaphysical? Okay, good. That's the question. I'm bringing this back up again. So I I, I agree with you that. Um, Well, I, I don't know if, I never know if I'm a pluralist or not. Let me start with that. So I, I think of lineages as these really complex objects that are so complex, we can't, we can't actually describe them all in one go. We've got to pick parts of it that we think are the, the relevant parts for what, what the research problem is at stake. And so like I, in this case, the mitochondrial lineages and the groups that we see there, those are real groups. But these groups that we see from the nuclear DNA, these are also real groups. But I, I think that lineages, going back to Mike's question, they get so reticulated that you get all these different histories. And I think they're all real histories. I just don't think any one of them has a single claim to priority. There's no privileged history. And in some ways that's a epistemological pluralism because I think we have to identify which of those is the right one for the problem at hand, but I think it's a metaphysical monism. So I don't think there's, I think they're all parts of a, of a single object. So the reason I think of this as a metaphysical problem is because when I think about how I'm gonna classify these things, um, I'm part of that question is when has or have the polar bears become a distinct thing from the brown bears? And so when I'm looking at like the mitochondrial DNA here, we see the polar bear is inside of the brown bears. So there's two different ways we could resolve this on classification. We could say that there's a, a species brown bear and a subspecies polar bear. There's other views, these aren't real widely accepted, but there's influential views that say, well, it turns out that brown bears or species can have species as parts, which is kind of a weird view if you are, if you want a hard ranking categorical system, then species shouldn't have other species as parts, right? But that would be, a, that's a view that could be advocated here. Um, I don't think I'm actually answering your question. So let me go back to it. So you want to know about classification and why it's a metaphysical problem. I think of this as a metaphysical problem because I'm, I think of this as a question about what kinds of things are there in the world. And I think that what the no solution solution does is it gives us a way of trading off what I think is kind of a poorly formed metaphysical question for lots of other sorts of questions. And when we shift to something like the lineage problem, then what we're doing, at least on the lineage problem view, 
what we're doing there is we're trying to give an account of what these different lineages are and what different histories there are and how those uh, relate back to other groups that we're interested in, in examining. And to me, that's a, a metaphysical question. But, it, but it, if you trade it off for a conservation problem, right? So if we wanna know how we wanna classify, suppose we think classification is really important for the way it functions in protecting endangered species, then it's not so straight a metaphysical question at that point, because then it's what, what are the things that we think we need to name so they're protected? Can and if I we just, look at things, yeah, go, go ahead. Can I just, um, cause I think there's a, um, I think the, the lineage of the term species is doing a lot of damage here. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think Darwin answered it. I mean, in a way that, I mean, this presumption that species um, were unique, distinct um, one one mappings onto real things in the world was was a pre Darwinian notion. Yeah, right? and it doesn't survive Darwinism. It may survive it, but it seems to survive in philosophy that somehow we're still looking for Aristotle's species in a Darwinian world or even a post Darwinian world. So it strikes me that this whole you know that there there's some confusion about what it what it it. it it, you, you, if you track in what it is to be a species from this Aristotelian past and then look for it in modern biology, you're never going to find it. That's right. right. And so I think there's something really awkward, I mean, awkward going on because the language didn't change and even Darwin struggled. Yeah. I mean, how do you express this different notion using the language of species? Um, so I, I, I guess for me that, that there's a, that, that, what our expectations are for what it is to be a species is locked into a particular metaphysics, right? In that sense, it's metaphysical, but it's a metaphysics we don't accept anymore. Well, anyway, that was one, one thing I didn't mention. I, I think you're absolutely oh. right about Darwin. I, I, I actually think uh, I agree with Arashevsky and, um, and I think Brent Mishler also has a paper on this where they, they describe Darwin as a skeptic about species and especially the way he talks about uh, varieties and species not really having any meaningful difference. I, I actually think that's a, another example of a no solution solution to it. It's shift, and he, he shifts the question several times in the origin. So he, keep, he keeps going back and forth and uses lots of different notions of what species are, which of course leads to biologists mining and philosophers mining the origin, trying to find their favorite definition in it. I think too, I'll go back to the, um, you know, part of what motivated this was, was talking to a bio, and one biologist in particular about why he asks his students what a species is at their dissertation defense. Um, and I, I'm kind of just reporting the answer he gave, which is that he, he doesn't care which view they advocate. He just wants to make sure they understand what the debate's about and that they're able to move through that in a sophisticated way and understand why there's so much disagreement over which groups are the relevant or, or, or interesting groups. The challenge, I mean, you're right. The challenge is we still use the term species and we use it to talk about lots of different groupings. And what I have come around to is trying to, I, I think there's utility in, well, there's terrible utility, but utility nonetheless. Um, in the, in the term species. And I think if you try to get rid of that term altogether, you're gonna be moving away from the way biologists actually talk about what, what it is that they're doing. So some of this is an attempt to try to retain the way biologists use the term species where they don't actually seem that committed to it in particular ways, unless they are advocating for a particular species concept that, they're, that they have some reason to be committed to. Because that usually is separated from their research, turns out. One quick one. I mean, I agree with you. I think you're, you, what you're defending, I endorse, which is a skepticism about Aristotelian species, but an, an embracing of pragmatic notions of species. So, so that's why it's confusing, because when, you know, I think people aren't, are, again, I think the, the skepticism is that there's this one unique way in which we can represent the way the world is. Not that there's nothing in the world. There's lots of things in the world, yeah. right? But our representational challenge isn't met by a single notion to do all of these different jobs. But anyway, that's a more of a lecture. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thanks, great nice. question. Yeah. Still so, Nato, the floor is yours.
Hey, thank you all. Thank you, Matt, very much for the insightful talk. Uh, I'll try to be coherent here. I have many questions, but I will do just one and try to be uh, consistent. <laughs> I should say many things, but I really want to try to understand what is actually your project. So it seems to me that you are doing some trade-offs. You are hiding the, the old problems into a new, uh, into a new like phrasing or framework. So here's why. Um, so you mentioned that the problem with the species problem is this diversity of uh, disputes, right? We can dispute between defining species because of processes patterns, but there are all other sorts of motivations, right? And then what you do is you say, well, uh, if we adopt a skeptical position about this problem, we should just, uh, we should do this trade-off between the, the species problem and something that is more tractable. And then like the trade-off you did was with uh, the lineage problem, but you also recognize the possibility of other trade-offs. For example, when we are talking about conservation biology. So it seems to me that when you do this movement, when mm -hmm. you recognize this different possible trade-offs, you are recognizing uh, that uh, the diversity of disputes is still in place, right? Yeah. So and so thinking about this, I thought, well, but maybe he sees some advantages in doing the trade-off anyway and claiming that there is a plurality of trade-offs, right? And it seems to me that something that you are really interested in is in the idea that uh, a trade-off makes the problem more tractable. So the lineage problem is more tractable than the species problem. So one, so there are two, so one comment and one question. Yeah. So the comment is going uh, with Mike, right? Uh, it seems that you don't want to recognize that there are conceptual issues in the lineage problem, right? You mentioned that this problem is highly tractable. The questions involved here are empirical and methodological. Yeah. So there might be conceptual problems there as well. Yeah. So this is just a comment. So the question is, uh, well, what about the other possible trade-offs? Are they also, uh, let's say the conservation problem, is this problem also highly tractable? So in other words, every time that we do the trade-off, to the new problem. Are we always getting more tractable problems? Yeah. That's great. It's a, it's a good set of questions. So for, a, a, first, a clarification. It's not that there's a, it, this, the, the species problem problem isn't that there's a diversity of problems behind the species problem. It's that we're unlikely to settle what, which of those problems is a relevant one for generating it. And so yeah. we're conflating those different problems and we're not seeing that, they're, that the species problem is generated in so many ways that there's not a fact of the matter what, what problem it is generating that. So it's not just the diversity of problems. So I don't wanna get rid of the diversity of problems. And I think the diversity of problems generating the species problem are all really interesting and good questions to be asking or good problems, research problems to have. So just a, that, that's one clarification. So it's not that I wanna get rid of those. When we trade off though, and you're right, in the talk, I really, I, I act like, oh, lineages are straightforward and easy to track. That, that's not true at all. They're really hard to track and they're really hard to, it's hard to figure out which lineages are the interesting or right ones to, to, to track. And there are absolutely conceptual problems there too. As you well know, as you've written about, like what, what a lineage is, isn't, isn't obvious. And I think it ends up getting tied into other issues like what's reproduction and growth. Um, what are individuals? There's all kinds of conceptual problems there too. That said, I do think they're more tractable. And I think they're more tractable because it's, it's, you might still have a diversity of problems there, but you don't have the problem. You don't have that same kind of feature of 
we can't settle on which problem it is that's even generating the problem we're trying to get to. And I think that's a, that's a unique feature about the species problem. I, actually, I expect it probably goes back to something that Sandy said, where it's related to kind of, we're, we're bringing these old metaphysical ideas that we haven't been able to shed in modern bio, in contemporary biology. So I, I don't think that tractable means easy. And I don't think tractable means there's no conceptual issues there. In fact, I think there's actually really good work to be done by biologists and philosophers in unpacking what the conceptual problems are and how those generate the empirical and methodological problems to, to, to unpack. Uh, conservation biology is a great example of it. Um, but conservation biology, I, I mean, that's not something I know as well, but that gets tied into you know, cultural and social and political issues as well. You can't extract it from those. Those are gonna get messy too. But the, it's a focused question to ask something like, what, what are the units of conservation we ought to try to identify? Now, will there be a single answer to that? Probably not. Um, but I think we can see where, those, where, where that problem is getting generated from. And we've got the tools in place to recognize how to navigate a problem like that and how to balance different competing interests in those cases. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Right, so there's no one else in the queue at this point. If you want, we still have a bit of time, so feel free to add your name, but I'll take the opportunity to ask um, uh, Matt to ask you a, a simple question, and uh, it's, it's, it's a question about the, the framing uh, in terms of um, characterizing the issues around species, at least in philosophy, and to some extent in science, as a skeptical problem. And I, which also was very ingenious, and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, but I, when I was listening at the beginning, it struck me as a different problem, one that's in, in fact um, consistent with your diagnosis that there is no fact of the matter mm -hmm. about that could be brought to bear to solve the problem. Uh, and when I was listening to you, I thought more of something like like a verbal problem, right? A verbal disagreement, right? No, so we people might agree. A verbal disagreement, right? People might agree on the facts, but they just use different words to to, to describe, uh, or, or the same words, sorry, but with different meanings to describe the situation. Uh, so, in the case of of of, of you know, the, you know you, of, of species, people might agree on everything there is to agree about in the world, but because they mean different things yeah. when they use the word species, then they end up with apparent disagreements, which are not genuine disagreements. Now, it's, it, it does, now, verbal problem or verbal disagreements aren't exactly skeptical disagreements, right? Um, and it's a little bit unclear whether the, the shape of a solution is the same one. So I, I, was, I was really wondering why it strikes you more as a skeptical question than just as a verbal disagreement. I mean, well, I'll go back to kind of the first question and the response that I, I initially resisted thinking of it as a skeptical problem, but I kept getting accused of being a, a skeptic. So I ended up just embracing the term. Um, I, I, the, it, yeah, I, have a, I have a friend who works in skepticism and I, I wonder if this, if this skepticism, if skepticism is like species, if there's so many varieties of it that it's a little unclear what a skeptic is. Um, yeah. So in some way, I mean, this is in a lot of ways a heuristic I'm using because I really like the idea of a skeptical solution that leaves a central problem intact. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to kind of, insofar as anyone thinks that Kripke has identified a version of skepticism, and I think it's a really unusual, it's not the typical notion of skepticism that we typically think of, um, but insofar as, as, as Kripke's identified a skeptical position or what a skeptical problem looks like, I'm, I'm willing to kind of double down on that. I, I like the way that, I like the feature of it of uh, there's unlike, that, that there's, there's unlikely to be a, a fact of the matter here. Um, now it, it could be, and you know, this is, it's a softer view than what his, than his plus quest example, because there, there's no, there's no way that's getting resolved. That's just the way he set that up. There's not going to be a fact of the matter. Mine isn't quite like that because mine's not coming from those rules. It's really coming from practice and the diversity of ways that biologists are uh, looking at groups of, of taxa. And so it, it doesn't have that same kind of rule-based force and that logical uh, implication that 
something like the mathematical formulation he offers does. But I, I'm, I'm fine with that. Maybe it's a more practical or soft skepticism, but I'm, I'm happy to accept it as such. Good. Uh, we can talk a bit more about that later. So, uh, Greg, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, during your talk, I was uh, thought of an interesting scenario uh, that has a probability of zero, but I guess has a certain similarity with the marsh man problem, the swamp man problem. And it would go something like this. One could imagine two different groups, two different groups of creatures that had wildly divergent lineages. Let's, for the sake of argument, go back to Luca. But through convergent evolution on steroids had ended up with properties, including even genetic properties that were indistinguishable um, in the current, you know, by biologists. But they would pass every single test of species but fail the lineage test. But, um, you know, probability of that is zero, but it's an interesting conceptual issue for yours. I suppose yeah. the only real world place where that might be is with continental splits where different populations diverged, showed wildly different lineages, then somehow came back together, even if not, they would almost certainly fail the genetic test. But what do you think of that conceptual issue where you essentially have two indistinguishable groups of populations with like zero lineage uh, commonality? Yeah. Well, I mean, my, my view in that case, if you had, if they were genuinely the products of distinct evolutionary trajectories, uh, I, I wouldn't think of them as the same species. I would think it was a case of convergent evolution. I, I call it the dogs on Pluto problem. So if you found dogs on Pluto, would they be dogs? It wouldn't be dogs. They'd be, they'd look a lot like dogs and they'd have a lot of dog-like qualities that they would be sharing. But, but that would, but the reason I wouldn't want to call them the same species is because if you do, you obscure what's the really interesting thing, right? That probability zero that you would have that degree of convergent evolution, we would want to explain and figure out how that happened. And if we call them the same species, we're going to obscure that distinct history that they did have. So I, 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 would, I would reject them as being the same species because we would be missing out on a lot of, the, of, of what the utility of designating things species are. Thank you very much. I, I like probability zero uh, counter examples though. Those are fun to think through. <laughs> Mac. Oh, uh, hi, Matt. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so uh, I just have a very quick uh, clarifying question. Um, so uh, my question is, how do you see the connection between the notion of lineage in your position and the species concepts, right? So uh, would you like to say that the species concept serves as a I don't know, as a criteria to distinguish lineages. Um, so ultimately, what, what I'm curious about is how your position like relates to the, the Queiroz uh, position. And you know, how, you know how, how, how do you see the relation between his position and your position? Yeah, so the Queiroz, just to, I'll make sure I'm, I'm, I wanna let everyone know and you can tell me if, I, if, you, if I'm getting this the way you understand it. So the way, the, the way the Queiroz thinks is, the first step is, is you get the lineages. And then all the other ways of thinking about species, all the other concepts follow from the, the lineage structure. Yeah. So I really like that view. And that's a view that I, I, I largely adopt that view also. But, um, but, but I, I'm kind of a lineage, uh, I'm a lineage guy, right? <laughs> um, I'm a lineage essentialist, basically, when it comes to species. Um, I, I think that there's, I can understand why people might reject that view. Um, I, don't, I don't think many contemporary biologists do. Uh, in fact, I think almost none reject that view. Uh, I think microbial area, that's where you might see some, uh, some hesitation to link things too tightly to lineages, because the lineages, they don't coalesce in the same way that they do at other levels. So it's not clear what that backbone lineage is going to look like. But even there, uh, they're, they're still thinking about lineages in a particular way often. So I'm, I'm inclined to that view, but I can understand why, why, most, why a lot of people might not be. But I think most biologists, well, yeah, microbialists are the, the exception, but there's a lot of microbes. But um, so I'm, I'm inclined to that. I like that view. 
but that but that's not but that isn't necessarily related to, to this talk right so this talk doesn't entail that you have to also adopt that lineage view of, um if you're going to be talking about species i think you do for other reasons but 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 there's nothing in the no solution solution that that dictates that i mean it's not an accident that i pushed the lineage trade-off here because I think that they're so central to what we're doing. So I think when we're talking about species or any kind of taxonomy, ultimately what we're doing is talking about the units of divergence and diversification. And the units of divergence and diversification are going to be expressed over time in the terms of lineages. And in different in different contexts, they're going to be um, they're going to be cleaner than other cases, right? So mm -hmm. Animals like us, you're going to have line, you're going to have those lineages recurring over time in particular ways, where microbes are going to be a lot more reticulated. But those are just different ways of expressing divergence and diversification at different levels. So, so that, that's why I kind of hold a lineage view. Right, and 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 you correct me if I'm wrong. If uh, if I can have a quick follow up. So because because I. I if I understood your position correctly, you would like to allow like um, lineages occurring at different levels of biological hierarchy, right? So you might have different criteria depending which level you're focusing on, right? You know, my view is actually makes a stronger claim than that. It's not just that I allow levels at different lineages, but I think that lineages are constitutive of and construct and can and constitutive of and constituted by other lineages. So I, I, I actually think as soon as you allow lineages, you have to have a hierarchy of lineages and you have to consider how they're moving through and between each other. Okay. Awesome, thank you, Matt. All right, thanks, Mac. Um, there's no one else in the queue, so I will give you three seconds to write your name or five seconds to write your name in the Q&A box. And if not, we will end up here. No, no, no taker. All right, let me just check the chat box. I think we've, we've had everyone. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank you, Matt, for this really great uh, lecture. And it's been a pleasure to uh, have you, um, not really quite at the center, but uh, uh, anyway, give, give right us. <laughs> yeah, that's the best we can do these days, indeed. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you again. And uh, uh, we'll, so the fellows and I will see you uh, in about 15 minutes, okay, so that we, you right. can refresh yourself. Okay, so on 3.15, we'll, we'll see you again. About, yes. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you very much. Everybody for the questions. It's great.